Change your heart, change your life, change the planet. Hey everybody, it's Tim Van Orden coming to you from Woodford State Park on May 2nd. It is a gorgeous day, 75 degrees down in Bennington. I'm not sure what it is here, but uh, probably in the 60s. And man, it's bright. Oh, the reflection off the snow. Uh, anyway, today I want to talk a little bit, hopefully a little bit, about the next 50 years of my life. That's right. I am now tipping into 50. So I thought I'd share about what that might look like or how I'm going to begin that journey, that process, as I, I exhaust myself in the, the soft snow going up this hill. You sink in a lot more when it's warm. Anyway, I've been listening to a book by Jane McGonigal called Reality is Broken. And she wrote it in 2011. And I first came across it probably four or five years ago. And something about it just turned me off. So I put it down, but kept it on my list of must listens. So I picked it up yesterday. Thought I'd start May off with a reintroduction to Jane's work about how you can save the world with gaming. And the reason that I've had it on this list is that I've made a lot of what I do into a game. Even what I'm doing right now. And so I I thought, all right, we, Jane and I probably have some alignment here because I do incorporate a lot of games into my process, into my workout, into really exploring the moment, enriching the moment, building the moment, <clears throat> or at least building my experience of the moment by letting the moment be what it is, and then just getting myself to show up in it. But now that I'm listening to the book again, with a lot of years of learning and a lot of years of practice, it's even less. Interesting isn't the word, it's less applicable. Because now what I'm hearing her say is not that we should make life itself a game, but that we should fix life by gaming. Meaning that reality is broken, in using her words. That the real world isn't good enough. And that we should fix it with technology. We should fix it with virtual environments. We should augment reality because, God forbid, humans for hundreds of thousands of years, or even millions of years, have been stuck in this horrific place called the real world. And God forbid we're stuck in this real world place any longer. It's broken, we gotta fix it. And technology companies, they've got the answer. Games, virtual environments, that's the solution. And if you've listened to any of my recent videos, you know that I'm not a fan of top-down solutions because they're not solutions at all. Uh, it's somebody has an idea, somebody has a, a virtuality in their own mind, this concept of what a better world would look like, how reality should look if we could just get rid of all the flaws, if we could get rid of all those broken parts of reality. Oh wow, that's, yeah, that's the good life. Then everything would be fixed. But this thing in here, this brain and this body that work together is as one thing, but also part of uh, a collective, we're built for this so-called broken reality. This is why we have the brain that we do. We don't have this brain so that we can sit in these environments that are 
constantly rewarding, we're constantly stimulating, constantly raising our self-esteem and, and making us feel like we're accomplishing some real thing, making real progress. That's not what these brains are built for. It's not what these bodies are built for. So, in a sense, the fix that she's suggesting will just break things even further because it will teach people that the real world is not their friend and that learning how to deal with the challenges and the discomforts, the upsets, the disappointments of the real world is not, it's not acceptable anymore. We should move beyond that. We're in human 2.0 now, uh, or homos deus, as uh, I forget the author's name. I think he's Israeli. Uri, I don't know. I love his books. Forget his name. Put it right there. Anyway, we're we're moving towards this age of post-humanism. And that scares the crap out of me. Because humans are barely, barely beginning to learn how to be human in a narrative sense. We've always known how to be human, but <clears throat> Our narratives are finally being explained by technology. But instead of using that knowledge to enhance our experience of the real world, we've got people using that technology to say, wait a minute, we don't, we don't need to learn how to be more powerful humans in this context, inside of these narratives. We need to learn how to escape these contexts and then we'll feel good then everything will be okay and don't worry that a few technology companies will be building controlling designing uh, monitoring these environments don't worry about that all you need to worry about is if you're gonna feel good all the time you're gonna feel rewarded all the time and life is gonna feel rewarding all the time that's where your focus should be. Uh, don't learn how to move into a challenging environment and make the best of it. Don't do that. Don't learn how to deal with everything that life throws at you and, and make lemonade. Instead, we should just chop down all the lemon trees and build virtual forests of blueberry bushes and mango trees and it should be tropical all year long. No more winter, down with winter. Yeah. Let's get rid of all these challenging moments, these challenging places, these challenging conversations, challenging differences in individuals. And let's just create this, this epic existence inside of these virtual worlds. And where I am at, in the book right now, she's talking about these epic experiences and, or epic stories as she said and it's kind of funny because she doesn't really understand the word epic epic simply means a spoken story that's what an epic is it's, uh, it comes from the word epos in Greek which simply means word so an epic is a story so an epic story is like the Rio Grande River. You're saying river twice, just in a different language, so you don't realize that you're being redundant. Uh, and it's a storied story, maybe. Maybe that's the, the connotation that it now has, that it's a story worth telling. It's an epic story. Uh, it's a story that you can't wait to share because it's a story that's going to raise your rank. It's a story that's going to get you out of the winter and into the spring. It's a story that's going to melt the snow all around you and suddenly you'll be standing on a solid foundation and you'll, you'll feel more competent. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you look heroic and that's why you want to share it. So these environments where we're, we're dealing with situations in which we can die virtually, but that's okay, we can just restart the game and play all over again. So there's really nothing at stake. So 
How can one be heroic when there's nothing at stake? How can one truly understand what they're dealing with or even themselves if there's nothing at stake? Because winter's coming back. Winter will show up again. Life will throw you many, many curveballs, or at least curveballs from our perspective. They're not curveballs at all. It's just life being life. But from our narrative, <clears throat> egoistic perspective, it appears like a curveball because it's counter to what we believe about ourselves or counter to the way that the world should be. There shouldn't be snow again. I just, I ran out of the snow back there. Why am I, why am I back in the snow again now? This isn't fair. It shouldn't be like this. I thought I got over this. I thought raw food cured depression. Why is it back? I thought that this magical diet and running every day would, would just change everything permanently. So why am I stuck slogging through the snow again? Year after year after year. And now I'm 50 years old and am I gonna have to do this for another 50 years? I hope so. <laughs> I really do hope so because it's not in escaping the world that you discover your strength it's by running towards it it's by seeking out the winters it's by seeking out real challenges with real stakes and real consequences but doing so in a really really small way and the result is not something that is going to be epic in the sense that Jane McGonagall uses. It's not going to be a story that you want to boast about. It's not going to be something that you'll want to post on Facebook unless you're like me and, and your goal is to share the little daily arduous steps in the midst of smiling, in the midst of sunshine and snow. Uh, but where's the result? Where's the medal today? Where's the finish line? Where's the cheering crowds today, right here? Where are the other human beings? There's none. <laughs> nobody wants to be up here today. Or at least nobody that I'm seeing. None of the parking lots have people in them at all the National Forest access points. Uh, so, this isn't a story that most people are really interested in because it's a story of continued effort. It's a story of continual engagement. Not a story of happily ever after. Or is it? I'm smiling right now because I hope the next 50 years is full of moments like this. And I don't even have to hope I'm pretty sure it is gonna be full of moments like this because this is who I am now. I'm the guy that runs towards things, not away from them. I used to run away from them. I used to, like, oh, I almost ran away from this. See, there's a little melt there, there's a little stream. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll run around it on the snow over here. It's a spring coming out of the ground over there, so I'll, I'll stay in the snow. And when I caught myself doing that just now, I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm talking about being the guy that doesn't run away from things. Oh, that's deep. I'm the guy that goes right through them and keeps smiling. If I'm gonna say things like that, I have to actually check in and make sure that I'm being consistent, make sure that my behavior is consistent. And now that I'm on the backside of Prospect Mountain, or should I say in the eastern slope of Prospect, the snow is really, really deep over here. Let me show you this tree. Let's see if you can see that. So the tree is warming up the snow around it, but you can see it's at least I don't know what you probably can't see, but that's about 15 inches. So over here, we're gonna have snow for quite a while yet. Because at ground level, it's, it's pretty chilly. The snow, the white 
reflects the heat back up so the and cold air sinks so it's a lot cooler down at uh, snow level so I'll probably be up here for quite some time yet exploring the, the snow and the woods and myself and and learning about where I'm going learning about who I'm becoming there's an ad for Masterclass, and you have probably seen them on some of my videos before the video plays. And one of them is by Malcolm Gladwell, the author of Blink and Tipping Point. And, oh, there goes the, uh, let's see if I can fix that. Come on, there we go, see? It righted itself. Thank you, Gimbal. Back to Malcolm Gladwell. In this ad, he I'm gonna paraphrase him because I don't remember the exact quote, but he says, the job of the writer is not to come up with the ideas, but to discover the ideas. And essentially what he's saying is, it's not a top-down approach. Oh, because when you have a top-down approach, things keep falling apart like this gimbal. Oh, come on, Gimby. All right, we're switching over to handheld. There's a great example of top-down versus bottom-up. I've got this $200 gimbal in my pack. It keeps failing on me, and now I'm using a selfie stick that I bought at the dollar store. Yes, this selfie stick cost $1. And if I use my Bigfoot stride, the quality of the video really isn't that much different. So, back to Malcolm Gladwell. It's top-down when you try to create it. When you use the images in your mind to fashion something from scratch. But it's bottom-up when you let the ideas reveal themselves. So your job as a writer is to discover the ideas. To be patient enough for the ideas to reveal themselves. And that's where I am in my next 50 years. Uh, it's not so much about top-down solutions of, this is the right way to do it and you all need to do it and this is the only way to do it. It's more of, well, let me go out here. Let me learn about things. Let me listen to things and let me process them in the midst of this environment and in the midst of discomfort, in the midst of voices telling me that I'm better off down in town or that I'm more of a contribution if I go along with the crowd and do what everybody else does. That coming up here by myself to, to discover who I am as a human being, but not as an individual, but simply the mechanism of what it means to be human. That's what I discover here. What are the tendencies of human beings under pressure? Who are they? Do they bend over and pick their hat back up? Or do they make up a story about how that tree disrespected them and how it's unfair and we should chop all the trees down because we can't have that because God forbid somebody sees our hair because culturally hair has become unacceptable. and. We can't show that in public anymore. So that tree has got to go. In fact, all trees have got to go because they violate social norms and it's just unacceptable. That's a human tendency to come up with cultural systems like this, but my job is to, to notice these as they come up in me, to notice where I hear cultural voices coming up, to notice where I hear the voices of uh, the stew that I was raised in, that I was marinated in. Uh, what is a man in this culture? What is a man in my family? What is a man in my community? What is a man in the, the context that I have chosen, whether that be athletics, or whether that be acting, or whether that be romantic relationships? And 
you hear all these voices coming into play. You should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do this. You need to look like this. Well, I come out here, I let all those voices show up. I observe them, I take notes, I talk to them. I'm gentle with them. I listen to other people talk about things like this and I process it in the midst of a world that doesn't need to be augmented if I allow myself not to be God. If I'm God, this can be flawed. If I am God, then yeah, reality is broken. And not that Jane McGonigal is a megalomaniac, but she's simply naive, as are most human beings. And I include myself in that mix. I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody else. It's just that I understand that tendency. I understand the built-in tendency of the the human narrative engine <clears throat> to always see its solutions as superior and its perspectives as superior and everything outside of my perfect virtual world is somehow broken or flawed and if everybody could just see it my way we'd live in a better world if everybody could just have the same political beliefs that I do we'd live in a much better world but would we? I don't think so. I think diversity of thought is really important because it encourages critical thinking. Uh, well, at least it did prior to social media. Now it, it increases polarization or encourages polarization because the algorithms limit what shows up in your feed and they just keep you showing more and more of the same things that you've just seen. But the algorithm chooses the things that are getting the most traction, which are generally the ones that are most emotionally salient, so people are getting steeped on all sides of any argument in a more uh, reactively homogeneous way. And we're losing diversity of thought, and that's, that's scary. So I don't see reality as broken. I see our top-down systems as inherently flawed. Uh, not broken, because they were never perfect to begin with. They're simply inherently flawed. And that's part of reality, I guess, so we work with it. All right, so there's some thoughts as I wander through the woods here in Woodford, and I have no idea where I'm headed. I'm just talking to the camera and, and moving through the snow. Hopefully I find my way back. If you have thoughts about this, leave a comment. Let's get this to be a discussion. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up if you like this channel. Subscribe and click the bell. And if you are excited to see what's possible in the next 50 years, come on over to Patreon. A buck or two a month. And we can, we can build something. I believe it's my goal and I'd love your support and participation. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye. Forgot to show you the look. Isn't this hot? We got the knee socks so that the boots don't rub on my calves. I got the big boots and shorts. Yeah, baby, I think I'm gonna start a fashion trend. What do you think? Oh, that's deep. <laughs> Spruce trap. <laughs>